Welcome to the Lightworkers Lab, a podcast for spiritual people who want to go deeper, aim higher, and design truly extraordinary lives. And now for your host, intuitive coach and spiritual teacher, Crystal Ann Compton. Hey everybody, it's Crystal Ann Compton and welcome to this week's podcast. I have been giving it a lot of thought and, you know, wondering what I'm going to name this wonderful podcast and I finally decided upon the Lightworkers Lab podcast simply because I have such a phenomenal group of light workers labbers i guess i'll call them these are people who are part of a group of students and we meet on facebook it's a private group and it's so dynamic it really is filled with so much good energy and i kind of want to bring that energy here into this podcast and as you know this is only the second episode that i'm doing and i really don't know exactly what this podcast is going to look like or what it's going to ultimately be, but it is developing. And I really do want this to happen because it gives me an opportunity to help many of you out there by answering your questions and also to just give some free teaching about whatever spirit wants to talk about this week. And before we go into the podcast too much, I just want to remind you guys that there's kind of a way you need to submit your questions. In fact, a lot of the questions that came through lacked certain things. For example, people would ask personal questions about their life, but they wouldn't give me their name or they wouldn't give me their date of birth and they didn't include a picture. And these are all things that just help me as an intuitive hook into your energy. And so if you want to submit a question, and I truly encourage you to do so, then what I want you to do is go to the Lightworkers Lab podcast page, and I've included a link to that page, and the URL is www.crystalandcompton.com dot com slash the Lightworkers Lab podcast. Go to that page and really read through the instructions because I'm going to need you to follow the protocol in order to submit your questions. Otherwise, I just can't answer them. And I did get a lot though, and I'm really excited about it. And I've chosen more than six this week because one of you, Sarah, <laughs> wrote in and asked some really cool questions that I that I would just love to answer. So I'm going to answer a lot of the questions for you guys today. And I want to answer more in each podcast, but just remember you're getting those questions to me in the right format. Now, before we go into those questions, which again, I'm excited to get into, I just wanted to touch base with you on a personal level and share with you some of what's going on in my life. Because even though I teach metaphysics and spirituality, and even though I'm a channel and an intuitive, I am also totally a human being and I have my own foibles. I have my own issues and I've been kind of going through a lot of them lately and I wanted to throw this out there because it really is my experience that if I am feeling something energetic or if I'm going through something in terms of energy or perception and awareness, it stands to reason that there are a lot of other people out there right now who are experiencing the same thing. And this week I've just been dealing with a little bit of loneliness it feels like and kind of a heavy energy and I thought it was me and I thought this was orienting or originating from somewhere inside me but as I commonly do with spirit messaging I really went into the energy of that emotion to determine whether it belonged to me or whether it belonged to someone else because we don't do that enough people. We don't actually examine our emotions when all of a sudden we're angry or all of a sudden we're sad or all of a sudden we're feeling something intensely that doesn't make sense. It doesn't quite follow because just in the moment before we weren't feeling that. Not enough of us stop hammer time 
and then go into those emotions and really check to see if they belong to us. And when I checked to see where this loneliness was coming from and where this sadness was coming from, I connected it to a few things that are going on in my country right now. I'm in America. I am specifically in Texas, which is not a country, although you'd have to tell them that. But we have a hurricane that is presently hitting Florida and it's just passed through Haiti and the Bahamas and Jamaica and there's been a lot of damage and there's a lot of fear around this hurricane and I think what I'm tapping into is some of that energy and it does feel kind of tornadic. I mean it's not a tornado but it's a cyclone. It feels intense. It feels strong and it feels like it's got this rhythm to it that I've been dealing with. And so what I've decided to do was just spend some extra time in meditation, spend some extra time grounding and in specific getting outside, taking my shoes off and standing on the ground, standing literally on the grass and on the soil and taking in that earth energy up through my feet just so that I can feel centered again. And it's really helped. And a lot of that emotion and a lot of that heaviness has been lifted. I suspect a lot of you out there, especially if you're in my country, are probably feeling that as well or some variation of that. And if so, I'd like to challenge you to really go into that emotion and check to see if it's yours. And if it's not, if it's coming from outside of you, then take off your shoes, my brother, my sister, go outside, stand in the sunshine, let that earth energy completely wash over you and take the energy of the earth up through the feet and saturate your body with it. That's going to immediately raise your vibration and also connect you to the planet. So that's kind of what's going on with me this week. Um, I have self-corrected and I'm really excited to be here today to talk to you. And I just have to say, because I think it's funny that I don't have a fancy studio. I don't. I am actually right now as we speak in my walk-in closet. <laughs> and I'm in my walk-in closet because it is the quietest place in my whole house. As some of you know, I have three huge Great Danes who barrel around the property and within the house, constantly making noise. I also have a really big husband who barrels around as well and knocks into things all the time. And I have a daughter and I've got a lot of stuff going on. And so I retreat to this little sacred space that I've created for myself in order to do this broadcast and also to do a lot of other things. And you know, a sacred space can be just about anywhere. I tell my students all the time, you can go into a closet and you could grid that closet. You could set it up in a specific spiritually energetic way and that will become a really safe, spiritually charged place for you to do your work. So that's where I am right now. I think that's kind of funny, but Think outside of the box on your end and see what kind of sacred spaces you can create so you can retreat from the chaos, the Great Danes, the husbands, and have a moment to yourself. All right, now let's dive into those questions. Again, I'm excited because you guys asked a lot of good ones this week. Since I mentioned Sarah in the beginning, let's deal with her questions first. And she asked, I want to say about six or seven questions, and it's only because they're awesome, Sarah, that I'm going to touch upon more than one. I normally just like people to send in one question, make it succinct, make it brief. Um, but these are so good again that I, I really wanted to share them with everybody. The first question that Sarah asks is, do we have the same guardian angels and spirit guides through multiple lifetimes, or are they reassigned each life? And the answer to that is yes and no. We can have the same guides life after life after life. And these guides can be angels. They can be spirit guides. Often, however, these are members of our soul group. What a soul group is, is a group of souls that tend to reincarnate together life after life after life. These are souls who are very closely knitted, very in tuned with one another, and often commonly share a mission or a theme around their lives or the reason that they are incarnating. So they share a lot and they're very, very close. However, not every member of a soul group agrees to reincarnate in every life. I don't know about you, but I'm hoping I can get a break after this life. Maybe take a time out and somebody else 
can do the reincarnating while I just take a breather. So that's what happens. Some souls do reincarnate while others stay behind, but they remain in the same soul group. And the one that stays behind, as it were, often acts as a guide or a companion to the one who reincarnates. And so we may think it's a guardian angel, we may think it's a spirit guide, but it's really a member or a really close spirit friend that is a member of our soul group. Now that happens very commonly. In fact, I would not be surprised if most of us listening to this right now have a companion in our soul group that follows us and helps us. However, there is another reason you might have a constant companion life after life after life. Now this is where things are going to get a little bit weird, Sarah and everybody else, but just hang on and bear with me because it's really, really interesting. As many of you know, we are but an aspect. We are but an iteration or a version of the higher self. The higher self seeking to experience itself dispatched many versions or aspects of itself into various realities, into various dimensions. And indeed, you sitting here listening to this right now are existing simultaneously with many other versions of yourself within other dimensions. But it's not just other dimensions, it's other densities. Now, what is a density? Simply put, a density is a house for dimensions. It holds all of the dimensions, and the dimensions within a density are all interrelated. In fact, they resemble each other. It's just that they vibrate differently. And on the lower level of this house, let's say the the basement level, we have a denser vibration dimension. And at the top level of this house, which we could call the attic, those dimensions vibrate at a much more subtle and fine or high vibration rate. And while there are different vibrations, dimension to dimension, they are all nonetheless similar. And what I've been shown is that each house, which is the density, which holds the dimensions, carries a specific energy. And this varies from house to house to house. And in this house, in which we're presently living, we, these aspects of a higher self, this house, the energy is love. This house, the Lord of the house is God. God is love. And we recognize one another via love. We commune with one another and with source energy via love. That's our common energy. And I want you to consider that common energy like a theme. In this density, we're running an energetic theme, which is love. And there are angels that are assigned to this energy. There are guides that are assigned or connected to this energy. There are ascended masters that are connected to this energy. And these angels and masters and guides do incarnate with us or lend help to those people in that house governed by that energy consistently, life after life after life, iteration after iteration after iteration. And while some of these angels and guides and masters might not always be at our side as companions, they are always around and they are always accessible, just as the archangels are accessible to us and are an infinite resource. So too are these subclasses of angels, masters, and guides available to us and specific to the theme that we're running in this house. And so not only do we have companions who are in our soul group who do like to accompany us life after life after life, and we them We also have these angels and guides that are here with us in this density and in this dimension and who do consistent work with us life after life after life. Now, if I were you, knowing how curious I am, I would wonder, well, what's going on in these other houses, right? Well, the reality is I was once in a vision taken out of our house and into another house. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most frightening experiences I have ever gone through. And I'm not going to go into too specific of detail here, but let me just say, as soon as I, as this aspect, could no longer feel love, 
The color was taken out of everything. The feeling was taken out of everything. It was as if I left this house, entered another house, and all I felt was blank. I often say it was like a moonscape that these angels were showing me. And it wasn't that it was barren. It wasn't that there was nothing there. It's just that I, as a being from the house of love, could not feel it. And my tour guides in that vision, if you will, showed me that they were endless, infinite houses, just like that one, the moonscape, just like ours, all throughout the universe, which is just one of many universes. Let's call it what it is, which is an omniverse. We have multiple universes existing simultaneously, just as we, as aspects, exist simultaneously. And so there's houses in all of those universes. There are governing energies in all of those houses, and there are similar reflective dimensions contained in those densities. And here I see that I've gone off the rails on a crazy train. So I'm going to wrap this up by saying that, yes, we commonly have this same guides, life to life, to life, not always necessarily, but we always have access to a specific resource of guides, life after life after life. Okay, does that make sense? Let's hop into Sarah's next question, also a good one. She wants to know if we have an option not to reincarnate after a life if we don't want to. She says, I personally don't really enjoy Earth. Yeah, you and me both sometimes, honey. So I'd like to have the choice. And my answer to you is that Based on my understanding and the information that I've been given, reincarnation is not compulsory, meaning we don't have to do it. It is a choice. However, having said that, and for some reason, I don't know, upon death and upon processing after death, most of us choose to come back to earth. Those who have left earth so glad so happy to be outside of the constraints of the body and outside of this prison planet, choose at some point after their processing to come right back and do it again. And I don't know why that is. In fact, my mother, before her passing, constantly said, I am never coming back. I hope this is my last soul iteration. Like, I just want to peace out and I want to go to a higher level. I'll be a spirit guide or something, but don't send me back to this crazy planet. And yet, upon her passing, I do believe at this time, she's either considering returning or is in the process of doing so. And there's a lot that goes on with that. There's contracts, there's agreements, you have a council, there's things that you've got to do. That's not your question. So the answer, Sarah, is no, you don't have to come back. It's not compulsory. It's not a huge karmic wheel that you can never get off. However, you probably will come back because for some reason you're going to want to. Her next question is, will there come a time when the world knows that aliens exist? The answer to that is yes. However, it's not going to be a massive disclosure. And we've got a lot of alien prophets out there saying that there's going to be this huge disclosure event where you see the president standing on the podium next to an alien. Well, that's not what I see is happening. In fact, what I see happening is a slow revealing of the truth about interdimensionals. And in my opinion, the government has been doing this for decades now, slowly dispersing this bit of information, that bit of information, debunking this information and that information, but slowly and surely growing the general awareness within humanity that this is a real possibility. You know, I have always suspected that shows like Star Trek have somehow been connected to this revealing process. In other words, they came into being to prime us for the eventuality that one day we would be living in such a federation, and I do believe that we will. These shows were created so that we could be okay with the reality of interdimensionals. And let me just say, I believe we need to be okay with that reality because interdimensionals are real. I've had experiences directly with interdimensionals, as I know many of you have also experienced. More and more people around the planet are having these experiences. More and more people, due to the advent of sophisticated technology, are having sightings of craft and even filming that craft and 
dispersing that information around the planet. So people are waking up and that's what disclosure is. It's not going to be an epic cinematic event where we see an alien on the podium with the president. Instead, it's going to be a slow waking up. And I would say we're probably about one third to halfway through that waking up process. The last question I want to answer that Sarah asked is, if our thoughts create reality, especially in the afterlife, she says, is it possible to will fictional characters into actual existence? She says, weird one, I know. Listen, Sarah, that ain't weird. <laughs> Listen, Sarah, I teach about that in my Everything Psychic class and in some of my other classes, and these are called thought forms, and thought forms are very, very real. Let me explain to you what a thought form is. A thought form is an entity or a pattern of energy and information that develops over time the more it has a host available to develop it, and it is created out of intense energy. And so if you have someone who is constantly in a rage, that person is constantly feeding an energetic pattern, which, if given time, will develop into an intelligent entity and can even become autonomous. If you have someone who is depressed, that energy over time will also create a thought form entity. And what we need to understand here is that the thought form created is heavily invested in the energy that created it. So if rage created the being, it seeks more rage because it feeds off it. If depression created the being, it seeks more depression because depression created it. And the more and more these beings are fed, again, the more intelligent they become. And once autonomous, meaning once separated from the host, they can act of their own accord. They can manipulate the environment so that you are more rageful because they need the rage. They can manipulate the people in the environment so that you are more depressed because they need the depression. They can even hop two doors down, four doors down, one mile away into someone else's house where there's a lot of rage or a lot of depression and they can feed off of that at the point of their autonomy. The good news about thought forms, Sarah, is that just as they can be created, they can be uncreated. And you uncreate them by going through some energetic practices like psychic protection and sage and crystal grids and all that good stuff, but mainly by stopping the energy that created it in an intentional way. Now, those are negative thought form entities. What you're talking about is turning a fictional character who we think about into an actual entity. Absolutely. Absolutely you can do that. And in fact, I think a lot of the avatars that people worship, a lot of the saints that people venerate, a lot of the gods that people follow were never actually saints or avatars or deities, but in fact constructs of people's thoughts. And once those thoughts took form and the people consistently worshipped the being, the being that they first envisioned does become a reality. And the more they venerate, the more they worship, the more they interact with that energy, the more this being is autonomous. I'm going to tell you a little funny story here because, you know, I, I really like talking about a lot of things, actually, clearly. But I like talking about Jesus because I think with Jesus, as opposed to the rest of the Bible, there are a lot of kernels of wisdom. And I just have an affinity for Christ as an avatar, for Christ as Christ consciousness. And as many of you know, I'm married to quite the hunk of a man. He's about 6'3", tall, drink of water, checks. I'm getting carried away. Anyway, as many of you know, I'm married to this, this beautiful man, but he's also a scientist. One would wonder how he ever ended up with me, but we did. And it's because we're such a great match for one another. But he's a scientist. He is not a believer. Wink, wink. I think he believes to some degree at this point. But he is also somebody who never believed in Jesus Christ. And so when I talk to my husband, which I often do, about my musings and my ruminations and about, in particular, Jesus Christ, he always says, oh, you mean fictitious Jesus? Oh, you mean the Jesus that never actually existed but was just made up by men? He says something funny like that. And I'm like, no, man, I mean the real Jesus. Jesus. Because what he might not understand is that it doesn't matter whether Jesus the man ever walked the earth. Because over the course of millennia, over the course of centuries, 
Over the course of decades, we have been worshiping Jesus Christ. Humans have been talking to Jesus Christ. Humans have been creating theology and dogma and doctrine and systems of thought around Jesus Christ, whether this was an idea of a person or an actual person. That by now, it doesn't even matter if he was ever alive on the earth because he is alive now. We either created this to be so or it is so and we're tapping into it or keying into it. So my husband thinks Jesus is a fictional or was a fictional character. Maybe some of you do as well. That's okay. Doesn't matter, Sarah, because at this point, Jesus absolutely exists. Christ's consciousness absolutely exists. And this is an energy now with a distinct Jesus characteristic that each and every one of us can hook into and route into our lives in terms of energy in order to interact with this being. This being is accessible to all of us because it's autonomous, but connected to each and every one of us. So that was a really cool question. I hope that answer made sense. And you know what, Sarah, I just want to answer really quickly because you asked a personal question. And I feel like since you gave me these other awesome questions that I'm sure everybody appreciated that I should answer this personal question for you. You say, can you tell me if my chronic illness and my chronic pain is a part of my soul contract for this life or Will I become well someday? And if I do get well, what can I do to facilitate the healing? And the answer for you, Sarah, is that this chronic illness is a part of a soul agreement. I wouldn't call it karma, like a karmic wheel, being stuck in an inevitability of pain and illness. It's not that. It is an agreement. It is something that you signed up to experience because within pain, within illness, and within suffering, there are always valuable lessons to learn, as I'm sure that you know. Doesn't make it any less uncomfortable, however. Doesn't make it any less painful. And while it is a soul agreement, this is something you were meant to experience, I do see a diminishing of the illness itself. I don't feel at this point that the illness will ever truly fully go away. But for now, what I sense and for now, what I feel is that there is a significant diminishing so as to make life itself more pleasing to you. But you have to be proactive. You have to be ever vigilant. And I'm sorry, but for some of us, that's just the lot of it. That's what we inherited coming into this space and into this agreement. For example, I have inherited disorders of the mind around eating, and I will always deal with those disorders. Will it be easier? Is it easier now than it was in my 20s? Absolutely. Is it manageable? Can I live alongside the awareness of this disorder? Absolutely. But is it always there to some degree? Yes, it is. Nonetheless, I'm healthy. And so I feel something like this for you. Not an elimination, but a mitigation. And to be proactive and vigilant with the food, with the vibration, with the people that you are around, with the toxicity that is evident in things that you might not consider. Things like objects, things like places. Places, things like geography, things like friendships, things like work. That's all energy. Never forget that. Always check in with yourself. Beyond that point of disorder or beyond that point of pain, there is a space that exists which will tell you what is good for you and what is not. And like myself, you're going to have to make some hard choices in your life to create and design your life to support the health and the wellness that you want to experience. And it is on many, many, many different levels, not just food, not just people, but on many levels. And so in this season of your life, commit yourself to determining what those things are, where those modifications exist, and then begin doing them and you will have relief. Thank you so much, Sarah, for those awesome questions. I don't know about anybody else, but I really love them. Now, I have a couple of other questions asked by people that I can give very quick answers to, so let me do that right now. This question comes from Rika, who currently lives in the Philippines, and her question is, is the man I am presently dating the one for me? His name is, and I won't say it, but first initial H, last initial M. Thank you very much for taking the time. Rika, very quickly, no. This person is not for you. For whatever reason, it's not lining up. Not now, not next year, not even in five years. This is something you need to let go of. This is something you need to work 
actively on moving beyond because something waits for you beyond this relationship, which isn't even fully developed. Something waits for you beyond this relationship that is far better than you could even imagine at this time and which you are deserving of, okay? There's issues of worth here that keep you in this relationship or keep you hoping for this relationship. We have issues of worth and we have connections that need to be severed because something better is waiting for you if you simply move away from what's not working for you. The next question comes from Tori M in Vancouver Island, British Columbia, and she says, what or who was the very bright light, like sheet lightning extending in streams, accompanied by a very loud thunderous sound when I was young. It made my head buzz, and I instantly translated the energy of what was happening into words that I heard, then repeated those words to someone specific. And in fact, it was the message from that person's mother. Will this energy ever visit again? Hooking into your energy, Tori, I see that what this was, was a gatekeeper. What is a gatekeeper? A gatekeeper is a friend in spirit, often an angel, often a spirit guide, sometimes somebody who has a similar theme in life as you. And it is the sole responsibility of the gatekeeper to organize all the energies that approach you and organize all of the energies that wish to interact with you. The gatekeeper essentially stands at the gate and only allows through that which you need to experience. And what this feels like to me, and as I look at it with my mind's eye or my clairvoyance, is I see a gentleman here, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's angelic, also acting as a gatekeeper. I see the message that came through the energy, which is sound, which was a transmission, as being filtered through that gatekeeper, but indeed originating from the mother of this person that you gave the message to. It was not the mother. It was your guide. It was your gatekeeper. And what I also get as a validation is that this was your burgeoning mediumship. You had the facility at that time to communicate with spirits or with the world of spirit. Don't know what was going on in your life at the time. This is not something I feel you ever really leaned into. But the question really is, can you get it back? And the answer is absolutely. If you're someone, and not just you, Tori, anybody listening, if you're someone who routinely had imaginary friends as a child, who routinely had nightly visitations from other children or other beings or angels or patterns of energy. For example, my daughter used to see this Brillo pad of energy every single night, and that Brillo pad of energy was a guide. If you're someone who had those types of experiences growing up, then it is likely that you too have the mediumship ability. Now keep in mind that all mediums are psychics, but not all psychics are mediums. In fact, I am a psychic. I am an intuitive. And for years, I acted as a professional intuitive. However, not such a great medium. In fact, I'm a crappy medium, unless I'm trying really hard, unless I'm putting all these things into alignment and really casting a wide net. It's too much work for me to be a good medium. Some people are born with the energetic constitution that allows them access points or that has access points that allows spirit to come through and give messages. And so Tori, I do believe I'm talking about you. And so if you wanted to explore this further, the first thing you'd want to do is study. Start reading books about mediumship. Start reading books written by reputable mediums. Consider something like a psychic or a spiritual development group. Meet other people who are mediums. Meet other people who are psychic and really try and dip your toe in and ultimately immerse yourself in the energy of mediumship because I would not be surprised if this started to happen again because you have a gatekeeper who's arranging the energy and the only reason you'd have that kind of a gatekeeper is because you can interact with that energy. Next question is from Anne D. And she says, I recently considered attending a weekend workshop on quantum touch. Because it was both out of town and expensive, I consulted my angel cards and got what I consider to be a pretty clear go. Being the indecisive person that I am, however, I then used the pendulum and asked the same question and got a clear no. 
Why the difference? And how do I know what to trust? This is a great question, Anne, and the answer lies in the question as you asked it. You use the term indecisive, which is just another way to say distrustful or unbelieving. You went to spirit with a great question because this concerns something that is in alignment with your life purpose and with your passions. And spirit answered you very clearly. However, you then actively began to undo what was given to you by then consulting your pendulum. And here, heads up. Uh, the pendulum is pretty much one of the last tools that I personally use because it is notoriously incorrect, especially if we have indecisiveness, especially if we have fear, especially if we have an investment in the outcome. In other words, if we really, really, really want the pendulum to say yes, often it will say yes, just because we really want it to be so. Now, that's not what we have here, Anne, because presumably you want to go. But there's enough fear inside of you around the expense of it, around the travel of it, around the people that might be involved in it. There's enough fear. And as you say, indecisiveness, that the pendulum read the fear and the pendulum says no. Now, if I were you, I would stick with the first answer that spirit gave you. I would also do the work behind trusting your psychic receivers that are involved in spirit messaging. We all have a variety of psychic receivers. Some of us are clairvoyant. That means we see into the world of spirit. Some of us are clairaudient. That means we hear into the world of spirit. Some of us are clairsentient, which means we feel when spirit's talking to us or giving us a message in the body. And some of us are claircognizant, which is where we receive epiphanies or eureka, aha, revelations, or one minute we don't know something and the next minute we know everything. That's claircognizance. There's all sorts of other psychic receivers as well. And each and every one of us has all of them. We have all of them. It's just that some of them are stronger in some people and weaker in other people. You can work on all of the receivers, though. They're like muscles. If you don't work a muscle, it's going to atrophy. And you won't be able to depend on that muscle to do the heavy lifting unless you start working out. You start lifting weights or doing weight training. Then the muscle begins to grow and now you can depend upon it. Now it can do the heavy lifting. Same is true with your psychic receivers. You have them, and You have to trust that you have them. You have to realize that you are living in a life where you have access to infinite resources, where spirit, the spirit that created you, is always around you and always talking to you and you are receiving it and then filtering it through your psychic receivers, which you are then not trusting. So the work isn't around quantum touch here, although I would say that you should go. The work is around learning to trust spirit and being willing sometimes to be wrong. I just was listening to Justine Uselding in the Lightworkers Lab last night talking about how to become more confident with your psychic readings or how to become more confident with the messages that are coming through spiritually. And she said, you have to be willing to be wrong. You have to be willing to step out in faith and say what it is that you're getting even though it's not going to relate, it's not going to make sense, or it's going to be flat out wrong. And so what you should have done probably, Anne, is took that first answer and embraced it and got excited about it and started to feel the joy and the hope around it instead of veering off toward your mistrust, your indecisiveness, and your fear, which ultimately undid spirit's messaging. I hope that makes sense. All right, we have one more question before we have to go. Thank you for staying with me so long. This has been super fun. I'm really charged up. I am loving your questions, so please don't stop sending them. The last question comes from Angelica, also known as Angelica, who happens to be one of my beloved students and a member of the Lightworkers Lab. And Angelica asks... I want to know about the mechanism of manifestation. I think I'm not constant enough. 
or I have some issue with money, old patterns that are constantly running in the family and also around not feeling worthy. And this kind of keys into what we just talked about with Anne. And I like this question because I think a lot of us don't really have the formula of manifestation down. We're not really understanding it. We think if we create a vision board and then put that up on the refrigerator that in one year we'll have everything on the vision board. We think if we grab a few Louise Hay quotes off the internet and post them around our house somewhere that whatever the affirmation validates for us will be present in our life. And while those are tools of manifestation and those are certainly helpful, they are not the entire formula. In order to manifest something, you have to master the skill of feeling as if you are already that of occupying the full energy of what it would be like if you already had that thing you truly most desire. And in your case, Angelica, you're talking about issues around money and ultimately you're talking about the business that you're trying to create. I didn't read that in the question, but I know you and I know that that's ultimately what you're talking about. You have to master the energy of feeling what it would be like to already be what you want to be. You already know, don't you, that that which you are moving into in terms of your profession is in complete alignment with source energy. So you already have half of it over. You're in alignment. When we're not in alignment or when we're trying to manifest something that source does not want from us, then we're like Sisyphus pushing that stone up the mountain only to watch it fall down again. And it takes a lot. It doesn't mean you can't manifest that way, by the way. Fun fact. But it does mean that it's always a problem. It's always a struggle and it takes a long time. However, when you are in alignment with what source energy would have for you, there is a flow and an ease around it. And I do believe you're in alignment with what source energy wants for you. I do believe you're using tools such as perhaps vision boards, perhaps affirmations, and I know symbols, etc. You're using tools to help you accelerate this manifestation but you have not yet stepped fully into the energy of knowing what it feels like to already be that. And so now I wanna go back to a story that I shared with some of my students already in Everything Psychic, but I wanna share with you guys too, whoever's listening to this, wherever you are. And it's the story of me becoming a medium. I was just talking about this. Told you I was a crappy medium. And indeed I am. But there was a time during my training that I was really interested in being a medium. I would look at my friends in class and I would look at other teachers and I would see, wow, they are fantastic evidential mediums and I want to be that. But it didn't come easy for me. I was Sisyphus pushing that stone, that boulder up the mountain only to watch it roll all the way back down. There wasn't a whole lot of flow. There wasn't a whole lot of ease. And so at some point, I approached one of my teachers. His name is Charles Cox. He's a medium. He's in Denver, Colorado. He's fabulous. Snaps. Snapping right now for Charles Cox. I love him. I went to him and I said, Charles, why? Why is it so hard for me to be a medium? Like I'm doing everything. I'm meditating, I'm drinking my water, I'm eating my high vibration food, I'm studying, I'm fellowshipping, I'm gong bathing, I'm doing it all. Why can I not do this? What's wrong with me? And he said something to me that I will never forget and I wanna share it with you. He said, Crystal, if you wanna be a medium, be a medium. You know, and I I stopped and I listened to that just as you heard that. And I kind of said, well, if you want to be a medium, be a medium. What? That's too simple. What? Of course I want to be a medium. How could I get to the being the medium part? And he said, no, 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 listen to me. If you want to be a medium, then act right now as if you are. Go out from this moment as if you are the medium. Start hanging around with other mediums. Start reading books about mediumship. Start immersing yourself in the energy of mediumship. And another thing he told me, Angelica, which you need to hear right now, is he said, Crystal, introduce yourself as not just an intuitive, but an intuitive medium. Proclaim it. 
declare it, step fully into the energy of being a medium. And even though it might feel like you're faking it till you make it, you ultimately will make it. And so I took this advice and I considered it. And again, it was so simple and I decided to take it. And it wasn't a matter of months. It wasn't a matter of weeks. It was a matter of days. As soon as I stepped out and started introducing myself as a medium and interacting with other mediums and talking the talk of a medium and doing things that mediums would and also being willing to be wrong and taking chances anyway and reaching out for the information and embracing the messaging that was coming through irrespective of whether I was filtering it correctly. As soon as I did that, the evidences came. All those spirits who used to just amble into my various experiences now made sense. I could hear them and I could understand them and I could interpret. Now, as my life progressed, being a medium wasn't such an important thing. I really didn't have a need for it as I began to give intuitive readings and develop my teaching that just, I didn't necessarily want to be a medium anymore. It was something I wanted at the time. And as soon as I took that focus off of being a medium and placed it onto something else, I noticed that whatever it was that I focused on started to grow and the mediumship began to wither because I was no longer occupying the energy of mediumship. I was no longer declaring it, feeling it, being it, running it. Instead, I was over here with this new pursuit. And soon, in very short order, I was not a great medium again. Yep, I can see spirits. Yep, I can hear them from time to time. Don't know what they're talking about. Have no idea who they're attached to. Usually, sometimes I do, but usually I don't because I'm no longer running the feeling of already being that. Can you smell what the rock is cooking? Do you understand what I'm talking about? This applies to absolutely every kind of manifestation that is in alignment with source energy. You want to get out of the house you're in now or the the apartment you're in now and you want to own your own home, then run the energy of already having that. Feel it. How good it would be to walk around your own house and to know you own that. If you want to be a psychic and if you want to have clients and if you want to leave your conventional nine to five, which I advocate, by the way, totally. And if that's what you want, then run the energy of already being a psychic and start telling people I'm a psychic. Start telling people this is who I am. This is what I do. This is how you can recognize me. And sooner rather than later, you will see the evidences of this in your life. The next part of the manifestation equation that too many of us totally ignore is the action part. You can want something all you want. You can spend your time dreaming and conjuring up the feeling of already being that. That's cool. But unless you take action steps, unless you start doing things that are in alignment in terms of action with that which you want to accomplish, you're really never going to get there. The universe always honors momentum. The universe always meets you where you are as you step forward towards something. Often spirit will come and get us, don't get me wrong, and will lead us somewhere. But when we step to something... When we say yes and move in the direction of that which is in alignment and which we want to manifest, that's when everything accelerates. So start doing the things now that will bring you closer to your ultimate goal using the example of wanting to be a psychic again. Take those classes, read those books, associate yourself with other psychic people, which Angelica, you do that in the Lightworkers Lab. Do that locally. Find people in your area. Do all of the things that you know you should be doing and don't stop doing that. Those are your action steps. This is how you train. This is how you ultimately begin to attract your clients. Move in the direction of that which you want to manifest and spirit will meet you on the path and take you there personally. One last thing about manifestation before we wrap up the podcast is please don't get too specific. Please don't spend your time on these vision boards with these very specific things that you want. Or like me, years ago, I would have lists. I would have the perfect man list. And on that list, there'd be 
how tall this man had to be, what color hair this man had to have, what this man had to do for a living, or what he should at least make, where he should live, how spiritual he should be, what he should be into, and so on and so forth. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. I know a lot of you out there do the very same thing. And I think lists are okay unless we are overly invested in them. Lists are tools that allow us to visualize something. And when the list is together and we've written down everything we truly want, we have to release the list. I burn my list in a little bit of a ceremony. I put the ashes outside under a sacred tree. I burn it though. I don't want to look at it anymore. I have already put in my universal order. And sure, I ask for specific things, but now I'm willing to receive whatever it is spirit wants to give me. There came a crucial point in my life, my friends, where I had to admit, shockingly, that I didn't know it all, and that in fact, spirit and God knew far better than I how to live a successful, happy, and loving life. My angels were crafted and made by source energy itself to help me to achieve that, and I didn't know as good as my angels. And when I came to that realization, I let it all go. I said, hey, yep, I want the love of my life, absolutely. You do the rest. Bring this person to me in your own time according to my utmost benefit, and I will receive it. So don't get too specific. Don't get hung up on what it has to look like. Don't pull out that list and start marking things off and adding things in after you've created the list. That's why I burn mine. The list is just a tool to help you to visualize it. The list is just a tool to help you run the energy of already being that because you can visualize it and really start to feel it. That's all that it is. After that, we must come from a position of thy will be done. I'm washing my hands of all the details and all the organization. Spirit, you got this. You're going to crush it and I can't wait. Now, there are some other steps involved in manifestation. For example, gratitude is so important. Being grateful for what you already have. Feeling gratitude when you are in the energy of already being that. There are also other tools that you can use. But for the most part, what I've just given you is the core, is the formula. And if you just do two of the four or the five or the six things that you need to do, you're going to manifest in fits and starts, in spurts, if you will. You're going to be sisyphusing it. Run the entire formula and that is how you will manifest. Well, guys, I have to say this was an excellent podcast. I am into it. A lot of you don't necessarily know too much about me, but I'm a busy person. Like, I'm a busy person and I barely have time for myself and I really look for ways to be energized and excited and to feel of service and to be there for other people. And this podcast allows me to do that. This podcast really gives me an opportunity to serve and to stand in the gap and say, Spirit, what do you want to say to these people today? What do you want to say to this person right now asking this question? If you have a question, whether it's about your personal life, then go to crystallancompton.com slash the Lightworkers Lab podcast. Read the instructions on how to properly submit a question. I'm telling you, can't read it otherwise. And submit your question. I would love to receive it. Or if you're like Sarah and you just have a general metaphysical question, if you're curious about something spiritual, please ask that because it's likely if you're curious, there are a lot of other people who are curious too. And so until next time, my friends and my listeners, I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are on the planet today. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Lightworkers Lab podcast. To learn more about Crystal Ann Compton, visit her website at www.crystalancompton.com or you can visit www.thelightworkerslab.com. 